Good morning, pod campers. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Who had enough coffee so far? I can't see you waving your hands, but I believe you. I believe you. So. Is there ever enough coffee? There's never. They ran out of cream, so that's the problem. But. Sometimes there's enough coffee for now. <laughs> well, I had enough coffee, so we're we're gonna get started and um, try to get you out of here on time. Uh, my name is Sue Kerr, and I am a local blogger. I'm a social worker and activist, and many other kinds of words. And I feel like I graduated a pod camp. This is my seventh time presenting in some capacity, and I've never been in the big room before. So thank you for making that happen. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I blog at Pittsburgh Lesbian Correspondence. This is my 10th year as a blogger. And I am um, put together this panel to really examine one specific issue, which is how we use social media to engage the community. And in that sense of talking about community building and actually doing some social justice work or whatever, however you would define that. Uh, I'm born and raised in Pittsburgh, and um, I don't know what else to tell you about me. I love soap operas, and I will be referencing them in my conversation. <laughs> and um, to my surprise, you know, there's only a handful of LGBT blogs in Western Pennsylvania and actually in the whole state. And that's kind of shocking to me, but. Um, just to kind of get the acronyms out of the way, we'll probably be going back and forth depending on what our personal terms are. This isn't an LGBT specific discussion, but we both happen to be part of that community, so that's what we're going to focus on. We did have some other panelists who unfortunately at the last minute had to cancel. But we, what we want to talk about are the universal issues that we learn from this. It's not just limited to the LGBT community. So by all means, feel free to ask any questions as we go along. Um, I'll let Tara, my co-panelist, introduce herself. Thank you, Sue. Hi, everybody. Good morning. My name is Tara Sherry Torres, and I am the owner and founder of a social innovator called Café con Leche here in Pittsburgh. Café con Leche connects Pittsburgh Latinos. We promote Latino culture in Pittsburgh, and we also create a space for dialogue. We have been hosting Latin pop-up events since January of 2014, so about a year and a half, and we've done just about 20 in four or five different neighborhoods around the city. Um, we also do a lot of, or well, are beginning to, and have started to do a lot of digital media, so we often put out videos of our events so we can continue the engagement of what's happening in the space. I also have a blog where I publish um, a different story or just highlighting something different in the Latin community here in Pittsburgh on our blog just to kind of push it out again to the community and really trying to get at the visibility of the Pittsburgh Latino population and really trying to educate people around what it means to be Latino, especially in a city that doesn't have a traditional Latin population. This past June, I actually held Pittsburgh's first Latin uh, Pride, LGBTQ Pride event, which was really exciting for a lot of reasons as well. So um, a lot of my experiences are definitely gonna be much more Latin focused. I have a couple of examples of some are queer and some are not, of just ways people have used, people of color, Latin people, LGBTQ people, and that intersection, <laughs> have used social media and hashtags to um, further a couple of different movements and a couple of different ideas. So I'll be referencing them as we're speaking. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Actually, today I moved to Pittsburgh eight years ago. So this is my eight year anniversary here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, and I'm just really happy to be here and I thank Sue Kerr for letting me and I think we can just kind of get it underway. Okay. Well, we're gonna start by talking about what it means to actually talk about a lived experience. Has anyone heard that term before? used, I'm, again, I don't know why I'm asking this, I can't see you, but I'm, you know, I'll take it, we'll, we'll, we'll just jump into that conversation, because we, we want to really focus on connecting to people's everyday reality, and that's really what a lived experience is, is that you're, you're talking about someone's actual, authentic experience of life, and it's, yet yeah, it's kind of just separated from the way an experience is interpreted, so when you see the gay community, for example, interpreted in media, a lot of people might think of shows like Will and Grace, or even um, like Ellen DeGeneres, or others, and those are not necessarily realistic. <laughs> I'm sure you all are shocked by that um, fact. And, and it's important to understand that 
that any individual person has their own reality and that they experience it and that it's, um, we want to try to capture that authentically. And it's also not filtering what people are saying. So it's by recognizing the complexity of somebody's identity and their experiences and also voicing what they have to say without putting some sort of um, editing role, which can happen a lot in, in a blogging context. And you know, I wanted to, Tara, just ask you, why is it important that we talk about lived experiences when we're describing a community? Well, I think media is a powerful tool in which we receive all of our news, but the media is ultimately a filter of what we would call a lived experience. And so it's important that people tell their own stories and in order to tell their own stories that people can hear, it's important for them to have a platform. And what happens with that platform? Well, the platform, again, is amplifies, as your blog is uh, <laughs> correctly named. Um, I think it really then is able to, I don't want to say it's going to ever drown out media. There's a lot of money that goes into traditional media, such as MSNBC. I shouldn't call out specific channels. They're all great. All journalists are great. All media channels are great. But it's an alternative to really getting news in a different way that's more authentic, um, that allows you to think critically about what a person might be experiencing. It also speaks to the intersectionality of an individual. So whereas the media, as journalists, often will focus on a specific story, issue, topic within a larger story, that isn't really giving you the full structural, the full environment that that person is currently living in. And so when you're able to actually access someone's written story or words through social media or through other um, means of technology, you're getting the authentic voice and you're understanding, oh, well, this person may live in a rural area, they may be gay, and they may also have a disability, it's a very different story than just learning about that person's disability or what that person might identify in terms of their sexual orientation. I think also with the LGBTQ community in particular, what's useful about social media is the degree of anonymity or the fact that you can um, set a limit on your privacy so that you, you, people can participate without necessarily being named. That's been a real challenge with traditional media requiring people to use their actual legal name and and that that's not that doesn't translate into every people's everyday experiences. Their legal name may not even actually be their real name, so to speak. And one of the things that's great is that people can create these accounts and, and share their experiences and still have the comfort of not necessarily being out if that's the challenge that they face or whatever. Um, the reason they feel to, to maintain their privacy. Yeah, I agree. And I think we were sort of speaking about this this morning. And I, I think what's interesting also when you think about groups that maybe, let's say, mar we'll say marginalized for the purposes of this panel, when you think of groups that have traditionally been marginalized or perhaps their stories have not been told in authentic ways through traditional media, we, and when I say we, I, I use the royal we of, of marginalized populations, have been able to create other means of communication. So I was thinking about back in the 70s, I believe, or the 60s, um, of the bandanas that gay men would wear. And the bandanas would be different colors, and the different colors signify different um, identities or emotions or the way that somebody might be feeling that night or anything like that. And you would never have to speak to people, but people in the know, people in the community, would look at you, and they would see your bandana, and they would understand who you were, what you were representing, and how you were feeling in that moment. And I think technology has allowed us to take these traditional, and there's so many other examples, that's one example, but there's so many other examples within people of color communities throughout history as well as um, sexual orientation and gender communities of all different kinds. There's so many examples of this type of communication. And what technology and social media has enabled us to do is to take it to a whole new level. So now we're really able to reach people out in places that you wouldn't even know existed or that they never even thought that they would ever be able to get out of because it's so remote or they're just, they don't have resources to even own a car to get out on social media. They can just get a Wi-Fi signal. Um, and you know, smartphones and technology still has, of course, its barriers, but it's definitely a lot more accessible now. And so people are able to get gain access to these conversations in ways that they could never, ever gain access before. Do you have an example of how you have personally used social media to share lived experience? Yes. <laughs> well, I think 
for Café con Leche, specifically for Pittsburgh, when I started, when the concept of Café con Leche came to me first many years ago, it was really coming out of the fact that I myself am Latina, I'm Puerto Rican, and I just really didn't know, there was no community here for me to connect with, and I really felt a disconnect um, between my culture and my everyday life, and that was problematic for me. And so I started saying, well, it's not here in Pittsburgh, I'm gonna do it, and what's free is social media, and that's what's gonna give me the visibility that I need to be able to find the people who may be already doing the work and or start doing my own thing, and you know, the idea of being you know, if you build it, they will come. And so I was able to really launch Café con Leche for free, really utilizing social media tools. I got on Instagram, I got on Twitter, I, I got on Facebook, um, and that was really how I started interfacing with people. And it's really been amazing to see how much the voice of Café con Leche has been amplified in Pittsburgh to tell people there is a Latino community here. We're strong and we're growing and we're looking to, bring, to become stronger and to continue to grow. Um, and you know, through this vehicle, I have continued to use social media to connect with other Latino organizers and media moguls, let's say, throughout the country. There's so many Latinos that are doing media work, whether it be a web series, a Twitter handle, um, a Facebook page, just resharing articles. There is really a strong Latino media presence in all social media, and that's really how we're amplifying and organizing amongst ourselves. And I have been able to connect with so many movements that I never even knew existed and has made me feel like Café con Leche may be Pittsburgh, and we're here, but we're certainly a lighthouse for a much larger Latin network across the entire world. In my case, um, I, I think blogging is where I've had the most impact. And I'm doing a series right now, of, it's a question and answer series. It's a two-year project as part of an art fellowship I have with um, Most Wanted Fine Art and Gallery in Garfield. Hi, everybody. Um, we, what, what I've learned in the past is that Q&As are very popular on my blog. People love to read them. And I'm often asked to interview musicians coming through town or chef performers. And, so I um, decided to try to do it with kind of the everyday person. And I had originally planned to publish 30 question and answer posts, and I've already exceeded that in six weeks. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, you know, what, what I'm doing is, you know, I have this series of questions and people can use a form, a Google form to complete them, or I'll send them by email or do them in person. And I just print their uncensored answers. I only correct things that they tell me to correct. I don't even correct spelling or editing or anything like that. Um, and I ask everyone, what question did I forget to ask? So I've already modified the survey two or three times by, to include the new questions that are suggested. So at the end of the two year period, it might not look at all like it did when I started. And the reason I'm doing this is because I think that people's everyday real experiences are important. In 2012, Vice President Biden made a big statement when he supported marriage equality that will and grace had changed the nation in terms of how we understood the experiences of gay men and lesbians. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. But the fact is, it's not they're not real people, in, and not all the actors are even LGBT. And there are everyday experiences of people whose lives are nothing like any character on that show. And I would really like the next vice president, whoever that might be, might be Biden again, I guess, you never know, um, to be able to point to more everyday real experiences and infor things that they've learned about real people. And so, what I'm doing right now is traveling around Western Pennsylvania, and I have a 26 county area, and I'm trying to get at least two surveys from every county, and um, well, that's going to keep me moving for a while. And it's not perfect because my questions shape the narrative, and I know that, but I can't just do an open-ended oral history. I'm not trained to do that, so I'm, I'm trying to just stick with what I know how to do well. And then, of course, people share those stories, and, and, and they get spread around, and, and I think that that's at some point going to be pretty interesting that people will realize, wow, there's a lot of LGBT people living in Elk County. Uh, I didn't know that <laughs> until I got started. So um, so blogging is my main tool, but I, I also like Twitter and Facebook, and um, I use Instagram more for my personal life, I think, than, and, you know, mostly post, and that's where I kind of share my lived experiences, I think, is that I really get into day-to-day -day life with my partner, and then also, um, when I go to places like, you know, I'll put some pictures up from here to just show kind of like what was PGH lesbian, what, what does that mean in, in, in a photo array. So, um, 
you, know, you can feel free to ask questions at any point. You, you have to kind of stand up maybe if you want to do that. I'm breaking the mic rules. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, tactically, how do you reach out? How do you do research? And what is your primary method for doing that? Yeah, sure. Just to clarify, so you mean in terms of finding networks yeah. that might be hidden? Yeah. So for me, um, so aptly named is this panel beyond the hashtag, right? And so what I found is that going, so I have a Twitter account, and so I go onto Twitter and I'll type in the keywords that I'm trying to, that connect back to the things that I'm trying to connect to. So what I do for Twitter is I type in Café con Leche, which is my business name, because that allows me to find anything that's being tweeted out about me that maybe somebody didn't tweet at me that I don't know about. Um, but it also is cute because I can find people's pictures of Café con Leche, right? Café con Leche in Latin America is a very cultural practice. We all drink Café con Leche every single morning when you go to someone's house, they're offering you Café con Leche. So it is a place of home, of, of family, and of community. And so I'm always just retweeting pictures of Café con Leche to sort of re- um, to affirm that as a part of our culture and as a, a part of our connecting. I also look up my own name just because, again, I'm trying to retweet any media that's out there. And then if I'm having an event, I'll look up names that are connected to my event. Um, I also look at tweets that other traditional um, channels are, are tweeting out. So who are they tweeting out when it's about an article about Latin people? Um, and a lot of it has just been like, like shooting stuff at a wall and seeing what sticks and seeing if there's certain words that resonate with people. It really is sort of like a down the rabbit hole scenario. Like the more, um, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram, the more at symbols that you can kind of continue to follow will help you identify who the people are that are following the people that you're following. Because that's all in the same network. Um, I think the other thing is that's really important is that we are talking about social media. I think that while social media is extremely powerful and we need to be on it, it will never fully replace face-to-face -face interactions. And so the other thing that I try to do is get out there and get my face to be seen, You know, whether it be people who are doing Latin networking or people who are interested. I'm very interested in community development. Um, so any community development networking things I'll go to just to be able to connect with people. Um, one of Café Golich's values is also connecting to the African diaspora and repeating that experience because um, Latin culture is, 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 is African innately and indigenous innately. And so I try to also look for things and connect with people and groups that are doing work around that. And again, who are they following and who's following them? Because those are the people that I want to be reaching. I. Uh, use similar tactics with searches. I have a zillion searches on Twitter, or Ho I use Hootsuite, and so that's really nice to keep them organized. And I occasionally do it on Instagram, but I also use lists, and I have several Twitter lists set up to follow the key people whose voices I want to hear around certain issues. And I do that on Facebook as well. I'll set up, I guess they're called lists or groups or whatever, not a group, but it's um, a list to, to make sure that I touch base with people whose voices I, are authentic and are speaking to me on a certain issue. When the Black Lives Matter social movement broke out last year and began gaining momentum, um, a lot of people were using the hashtag, and it took a while to figure out who was actually creating the original content. And But on Twitter, you can do that if you put some effort into it. And so I was able to figure out who I really needed, needed to be listening to, and then what I was doing, and this is an important component of uh, what we're talking about today, is I was sharing their content unfiltered no comment for me, I wasn't editing it, I was giving it a signal boost or an amplification. And I made a concerted effort to do that. What happened as a result is I gained new followers. And so then I had this engagement with a whole new group of people that I previously had didn't even know existed really. And then I made a concerted effort, and I'm just using this one hashtag as an example, to look locally and using, using Twitter to find who was talking about Black Lives Matter on a local level, and then I began following them. Eventually I friended them on Facebook, and we have this much more robust relationship now, and I'm starting to see how their work on a local level ties into the work that I do. So a lot of it is doing some research and paying attention. Um, I'd say a big piece of it is, is listening, which you might say is actually reading because you're in social media, but it's sitting back and allowing people to tell you what, what they think is important and what, they're, what they value, and then the things that resonate with you is using your privilege and credibility to share it with your followers, 
Um, you may not necessarily even agree with it, necessarily, but I still think it's important for people to read. And that's true across other um, movements as well, I think. Yeah, and I would say, kind of just continuing on with the hashtag thing, it's one of the things that traditional media does help with is that if they do get wind of a story, they will amplify it in a way that social media cannot amplify. So there is a place for traditional media articles to cover certain topics that are gaining momentum. So for example, recently, and I forget which news outlet, um, but it was a pretty traditional news outlet, put out a story about what's going on in Puerto Rico. Right now, Puerto Rico has defaulted and will continue. To, it's defaulted. It is defaulted, and that is that, on uh, $78 billion of debt. And it's really crazy what's going on in the island and not a lot of people know what's going on and what is going on is that the only thing that you're really hearing is from traditional news outlets is that everybody's leaving Puerto Rico moving to Orlando and that's true to an extent but what's happening is that other experiences again other lived experiences are not being amplified per traditional media so recently a traditional media article came out and the article said young millennials staying in, P in Puerto Rico and I was like, oh, this is me. So I clicked on, I mean, I'm not saying in Puerto Rico, but that's, my, that's where my mother's from, and, and I'm a millennial, and I'm like, this is, my, this is speaking to who I am, the business that I have. And I clicked on it, and it was an article about a hashtag called Yo Me Quiero, which means I stay here. Um, and I'm gonna stay right here, that's what that means. And it's a hashtag for millennials in Puerto Rico who often are, have families, that they're saying, we're gonna stay here, and they do the hashtag, yo me quiero, and then they talk about why they're staying here. And a lot of them are small business owners, and they're saying, we're staying in Puerto Rico because we believe as small business owners that we have a place to stay here, give value to this island, and continue to build our business because we love it here. We love it here because of the beaches, we love it here because of the mountains, we love it here because of our families, we love it here, whatever it is, but it really is allowing the Puerto Rican community on the island, but also the diaspora in the United States to be able to connect and have a real conversation around, given our limited resources, given the way that the legal and financial structure of Puerto Rico currently is, what is it that we can do as millennials and as small business owners to continue to hold up Puerto Rico to hopefully one day be able to move on from this economic mess that we've been in for a long time? Other questions? Well, another point I wanted to make that ties a little bit into that, but it's, it's, it's a broader, is that it's important to access research being conducted right now. And, uh, in terms of the LGBT community, which is my primary focus, the Pew Research Center does a lot of work, the Williams Institute out of UCLA, and there's a group called the Movement Advancement Project. And they're, doing, they're crunching a lot of data on how LGBT people use social media. And it's, it's very important to inform our work because it, at this point it pretty much shows that we, are, we, LGBT people, are using Facebook much more than any other platform. And we use it more than the typical population. So there's this perception that everyone's leaving Facebook, which is a little bit skewed in itself, but it's actually not true for LGBT people. It's also not true for people who have lower incomes. And that makes sense when you think, especially younger people, it makes sense because to use Twitter, and Instagram, and even Tumblr to some extent, you need to have uh, a smartphone. But Facebook, you can go to the library or where someone has a, a PC or a laptop and, and access it. So it's important for LGBT organizations, businesses, and community leaders to understand that Facebook is still a primary means of communicating with people, especially individuals who happen to be both LGBT and lower income. Mm -hmm. And so following the data is, is also important, not just following the, you know, what the general um, sense of interest says about, you know, oh, everyone's quitting Facebook, or everyone's getting on Twitter now, or. You know, or we're all moving to Snapchat, and, and that's, you know, I think that that's important. I'm not trying to denigrate those forms of social media, but you have to figure out where your population is. And, um, you know, the joke about Pittsburgh is always 20 years behind everybody else, so there's a lot of people just getting on Facebook <laughs> in, in the LGBT community in Pittsburgh. And actually, that's quite true. A lot of senior citizens are joining now, and um, because they find that that's how they can stay in touch with the community, because a lot of our newsletters have disappeared. We don't have a media source in Western Pennsylvania. The, the two media sources are here in this room. I think, are you still here, Tom? There you are, yeah. Tom Waters is a blogger, and, and my blog, and we're pretty much it. And so, you know, you better hope we get it right, and we, <laughs> we try our best. But, but that's why I think it's important that we, we do look at the real data and use that to inform what we're trying to accomplish, because, you know, um, it's, 
it's really easy to kind of get trendy when you're trying to build community. Um, I, I, I've worked with a couple community groups and they're like, let's get Tumblr, let's get Instagram, let's get Snapchat. And I'm like, let's get some policies, let's get some planning in place, let's figure out how we're gonna make this happen. The idea of using Snapchat with youth as an adult is not, and a social worker is not necessarily really comfortable. <laughs> like I wanna have some really good policies in place and, and, and it's not even true that most of those youth are on Snapchat. So I think you, know, you can do some keyword searching on Google to find the, the, um, the Pew feed and see what kind of you know, trends there, because they're not, they're not just LGBT focused, but that's what I read in particular. Yeah, I, I think that that's so true. Uh, that, oh my goodness, so much. <laughs> so I think first of all, Latinos are also some of the highest, if not the highest, social media users um, in like ever. And a lot of the reason why that is, is because if you think about who Latinos are, where we're coming from, we are all over. We often have families in several different countries, across the country, and a lot of that is just given our, our migration history and our immigration history um, to the United States has just let us be a culture that is often very spread out. And so we keep in touch with people through Facebook and Twitter because that's easy for people to be able to use. It's cheap, what's free. And um, it can be, there's a lot of different ways that you can engage with your family members who might be far away and you can kind of keep in touch with what's going on in a much more real time basis, whereas before you didn't. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that it's just really important, <laughs> like, just kind of to what Sue said. <laughs> One thing that I also think is important to understand though is what are the barriers to people accessing social media? Because you can't do all of your community engagement online. Obviously that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Although in some, pre in some cases that's ex that exclusivity is working where people are creating virtual spaces and um, I think we have a, a good intersection here with Bambi's. Uh, yeah, piece. I was just going to say. <laughs> uh, so there's a trans Latina advocate, national trans Latina advocate named Bambi Salcedo, and she has an online magazine called Porque Si Magazine, which means, um, Porque Si is like, well, of course not, why not? Of course not, why not? Um, not a very good literal translation, but that's the best way to say it. Um, and it's really, it's just a website that people anywhere in the world can submit a blog in Spanish or in English, they can submit a blog post, a story, a video, um, anything that can just be posted onto the website. And so it's just there, it's a living website, people can access it whenever they get a chance. So if you can only go, if you live in a very remote area and you can only get to the internet once a month, but you can always go to this website when you get there once a month and you can read stories from other people who are probably hearkening and, re and, and reflecting back to you a lot of your own experiences and you may not be able to hear similar stories to your life experience if you're living in a very remote area, perhaps there's not another queer person there, so this website will always be there to be a place for people to find community, touch community, build a relationship, Kafe Gomez is actually gonna be taking this website over for Bambi because she has amazing and has moved on to um, organize through the Trans Latina Coalition. So I've worked with her to agree um, to take over this website. And one of the things that I would additionally like to do is open up a Instagram account. It already has a Facebook and a Twitter, but I would really like to open up an Instagram account so that we're not only doing this um, but on the website and people can access the website, but if you're able to get onto Instagram, we can actually repost your photos. So you could email Porque Si Magazine a photo of where you live and we could post it for you, giving you credit, you know, saying where it is on the Instagram and then that's able to, whoever's following Porque Si Magazine on Instagram, is those followers are able to see a piece of your life in terms of what is it you walk by every day? Who is it? Who is your family? What are the what are the things that you're trying to show people from where you're from? So it just really continues to do this back and forth reflecting of experiences that there may never be a conversation, but it's definitely a community. I was curious about when you mentioned the, the Q and A that you do with Google Docs, and I just discovered Google Docs and their survey form. And when you mentioned using a Q&A to develop blog content, that really interested me. Can you talk a little bit more about how you, how you do that, how you reach out to people with your questions, um, how to use Google Docs to do that? Sure, um, that's a great question. When I came up with the idea of doing q and I realized that typically I just interviewed one person at a time, so I would just email them the questions and they would send them back worked really fun. 
but I couldn't just email every LGBT person in Western Pennsylvania. That, that wasn't possible. So I knew that I had to come up with different ways to reach people. And I have used Google Docs in the past, so I created a form and tried to make it look nice. And I added the questions. And it dumps the answers into a, um, a spreadsheet, a Google spreadsheet, which made it really easy for me to access and sort through and get what I needed to create my content. So I could you know, just cut and paste it right into my, the blog post. But there's a lot of people who aren't comfortable with that. So in addition, I can email people the questions, or I can, I'll can make a plan to meet with them face to face. And it's not a short survey, so it's not easy to do at an event. But I do have a couple tablets that were donated to me, and I use those. And I can take them to an event if someone wants to sit down and fill it out right there. That, you know that's possible as well. What I did with Google Docs, the URL is really long, so I used a shortener. Um, I used Bitly actually, and I just send that link around. Um, I post it on Facebook many times a week. I put it in lots of groups. I use existing Q and A's to recruit new Q and A's. But I think by having the Bitly, I can actually have I have the term amplify LGBTQ in it, so people have a little bit of confidence when they're clicking on it. Um, some people don't want to get into Google Docs because they don't want to tie their Gmail to their identity or you know, they're concerned about that, or they don't know me and they don't trust necessarily have a sense of trust in me, which I understand. So that's why I do try to offer the other options. You know, Google Docs is really easy to use once you practice with it a few times. Uh, the spreadsheets can get a little complicated sometimes, but but you know, if, you, if you're used to Excel, it's not hard to use and it will give you a nice summary of the responses and. Um, and you can modify it at your convenience. And how does uh, that compare to SurveyMonkey? Well, it's free, <laughs> so that's that's nice because I can set up a form with as many questions as I want. Where SurveyMonkey limits you, I think, to ten to ten if it's a free survey. And um, and this isn't a survey. It's 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 more of an interview. It's like an online interview. So uh, SurveyMonkey would really limit my ability to let people really write robust answers. To what I'm trying to do. Plus, I want to change my response. You know, I change my questions, and it's easier to do in Google Docs because I can manipulate the data behind the scenes so that I can see the old, the answers to the old questions and the answers to the new questions. So, I would just play around with it and, you know, make a fake form and see how it works and fill it out yourself and look at how the answers are, you know, populating into the spreadsheet and use that. People have a sense of trust of Google. Some people don't. <laughs> I think some people do, and, and so they're more comfortable with the idea of using like a major website to participate. Um, you know, the drawbacks, of course, are that some pe some people don't feel comfortable with it, and then it's uh, it's a lot of work to cut and paste all that into a blog. That's a lot of work, and so that's you know, but that's a price I pay to be able to do that. Yeah. Is that Michelle? Hi, yeah. Michelle. <laughs> um, I think that you have just identified the million dollar question for any organizer in the world. <laughs> I don't think that that's a problem that is solely for social media, or I don't think that that's a problem solely in social media. I think that when we talk about um, groups that um, organize around whatever piece of identity it is that they're organizing, or whatever belief or whatever it is, there's a lot of friction because it there isn't always a connection. And I think that 
a really good example of that was what happened with Iggy Azalea coming yeah. when, the Del when the Delta Foundation wanted to bring Iggy Azalea to Pittsburgh, and you really saw the division, the class, and the race division within an identity around sexual orientation and gender identity group, right? So what was happening there was that people were saying, LGBTQ people of color, queer and trans people of color were saying, wait a second, why aren't you talking about like colors that affect, or issues that affect trans people and people of color who are also queer, how, you know, you're clearly not even talking about it, and then on top of that, you're bringing somebody who is notably and definitely highly offensive. Whatever your opinion is, we believe that. That is our lived experience. So you saw a huge disconnect between what people are organizing for and then the value sets that they were sort of making decisions and choices around. I think with social, so that's just sort of, I think that that's something that as organizers for anybody, we are always having that conversation. How do we mutually support each other and each other's movements when we're all sort of fighting for the greater good, right? So that we're not, that we're all put in, pooling our resources. Um, I think for social media, what's cool is that in social media, so we can take a step back because it's this figurative community, right? It's an imagined community. It's not necessarily real life in some ways. Um, and I would just say that there's a lot of intentionality that you have to do as a social media user, if that's your intention. So again, it's about what are you searching? What are the community, like I was saying with Gothic Lomenche, I'm looking for words that resonate with my value system. So African diaspora, queer trans people of color, Gothic Lomenche, whatever event name I'm happy, you know what I mean? So these are the things that I'm looking to. So I start following people who are talking about that. So I think that that's one way. I think more proactively, a huge thing that I have found is video. People really respond to video. And so I think I would love to see as organizers around identities and beliefs and, and lifestyles, how can we use video to really engage and have those conversations with each other, sort of cross, across movements, if you will, because I think that people, out of all the things that I have seen, people respond the most to interviews as well as video because I think people just love seeing each other and hearing each other's stories. So I guess maybe, I don't know if I have an answer, but I definitely think I have a challenge, is like how can we use video to really start that conversation? And maybe there's other things, but that would be my, that would be my thing. Well, what I would add to that is that it's important to follow people. We've talked about how you try to find those voices, but you have to listen, and you have to actually honor what people are saying and accept that they, even if it clashes with what you believe to be true, that you, may, that you have to give it some consideration and examine it and look at the primary sources and have a conversation around, uh, with yourself, about, you know, why, why does, if it annoys you, why? What's going on with that? Um, when, when I read some, uh, I see a couple of things coming up about Black Twitter that, you know, the top 10 people to follow, and I always follow them. And I just start paying attention and listening to what kinds of topics they're talking about. And I don't chime in very often, but I do read tweet the things that resonate with me. And what I see is that people start to follow me, and then they are sharing my content. And so that's just a very entry-level way to show you know, mutual respect and appreciation and build um, a relationship that sometimes spills over into real life. Um, you know, a, a sad example that I worked on um, this year is last year in October, a uh, young uh, bisexual man of color was murdered in Lawrenceville. His name was Andre Gray. And he actually, his body was uh, thrown into the river. And so he didn't service until the spring and we didn't know what happened to him. And once I realized he was part of the community, you know, I was trying to work on that and raise the profile of what was, what, you know, what his family was going through, wondering what had happened to him. And then once he was, came home helping them with issues around the trial and the, the burial and now we're working on memorial. And it's been very interesting to me because a lot of the people that I've connected with through Black Lives Matter, Black Twitter, have come out in support of Andre. And you know, I'm not seeing the same response from the mainstream LGBT community in Pittsburgh. Now that's a whole other session we could have a topic on, but it's it I think what makes me feel grateful for that is that the time I put into that investment is having, is building community now. And that when I come out and say, you know, this man's life matters. He, yes, he's a man of color, but he was also a bisexual man. And that that's, you know, those are two intersecting pieces that were really important to him personally. Not that I knew of myself, but what, what, what was told to me. I never met Andre, but I, you know, it's, 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 
he has become a cause for me is to, in terms of trying to understand how you know, we can prevent that from happening to other individuals in our community. So I think the listening and the, the paying attention and the respecting people's opinion is really important. Not coming back with a, but classic example, all lives matter. Because, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a given. And so I, I, I think that in the sense of when you're saying black Twitter as a concrete example, then you know, the other example is that other people using Twitter need to make that effort. Yeah. Well, that was, I, I think that um, in hearing you talk, I'm, what I'm really hearing, and listening is important, and then I think also back to what I was saying about intentionality, so to be intentional about what I mean by intentionality is say it. I am so-and-so, and I want to connect with this, this, and this. Um, you may want to finesse that a little bit, and you may want to think about what's a fun way to actually put that out there, but that is, if you're trying to do something, if you're trying to connect with someone, if you're trying to create a network, say it, put it out into the universe, because there are other people who want the same thing as you, and you're not going to find them until you start to say it. Other questions? Uh, we have about 14 minutes. Um, Okay. okay, so there was another example that I really wanted to kind of talk. Oh, I'm sorry, there's someone right here in the front. I'll wait on my example. <laughs> Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. I appreciate that. Um, in Andre's particular case, we wanted to come up with a way to honor his life because the details of his of his murder are very gruesome, and there's a very high-profile trial scheduled. And, and um, actually, Tara helped me come up with the idea of creating a, um, a park bench that's going to be in a dog park in Lawrenceville because Andre's dog was also killed that night, and it was very important to him. So we're we put it in the, um, the in Lawrenceville in the Bernard Dog Run, and the Bernard Dog Run is named after a, a gay man who died a couple of years ago in, in Lawrenceville. So there's an interesting synchronicity there. Uh, it was it was for medical reasons, um, but so we're trying to raise money now to pay for that bench, and then we're also going to make dog leashes that say "Walk Like a Boss." because the dog's name was Boss, and they're in the bisexual flag colors. And we're gonna use that to raise money to, for us to sustain the bench. So if something were to happen, or, or become damaged, or vandalized, or anything like that, we'd be able to replace it and take care of it. And then it'll still keep you know, his memory going. And his family feels really good about that because we're creating a permanent space that's positive, and healthy, and beautiful, and looking on the river, and all of those things. And it's not, not a memorial at the scene where he was killed. I mean, this is, is, is more about moving forward and honoring the way he lived his life because he, he went down to that park sometimes. So um, if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll be happy to, to fill you in. Yes, there's a question in the back. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of disparity between lived, lived experiences, deep and complex and ongoing, and never gets captured in its entirety in a little bit. The hashtag, however, is a way to find, but it, by its very nature, tends to compress and simplify and leave out the complexity. So could you talk a little bit about finding a way to letting those two things work together? Yes, and I think, right, it's a really good point. And I think that, again, it's sort of like, this is the nut that we're trying to crack. Um, <laughs> always. Um, but I think for me, it just goes back to what I was saying about intentionality. Um, we have to create the imagined or real communities that we want, and so we have to be intentional. Don't look for one hashtag, look for five. Identify the five value systems that inform your work. Gothic Omeche has about six values, right? We have a six value statement, and that is how we make decisions, that is how we search. And that is also how we choose to take stances, if that's what, like, for example, one of our values is queer and trans people of color. And so again, with the Iggy example, I had to say something. I wouldn't be saying something if I wasn't following my values. The same thing for the African diaspora. Whenever there are anything affecting black people anywhere in the world, we're there too. You know, we're there to celebrate as well. So um, again, you know, so I think you just have to sort of think about what are these value systems that inform your work, inform your brand, 
or you're just really trying to figure out how you want to connect and amplify that and use that as your roadmap. And yeah, it's going to have to be 10 different searches. It might have to be 20 different searches. But again, it just goes back to that intentionality. You have to say it. You have to call it out. How I would respond is, is also is that beyond, when you find a tweet, beyond the tweet, you find the tweet, you look at who wrote it, and maybe you follow them and that's great, but they might have a blog. A lot of people put their websites up in their Twitter profiles or Instagram or whatever the, the platform is. And so dig a little deeper, because if they have a blog or a website or even a Facebook, they're perhaps sharing other kinds of content. And then just keep, keep pushing for that. Um, so this is really a timely question because, it, and again, I, I keep bringing up these terrible examples, but you know, there's, there's a, a epidemic of violence against trans women of color in our country right now. And um, we've had the reports of four trans women of color being murdered this past week alone. They weren't necessarily murdered this past week, it's just when we learned about them. And it's a little horrifying. Most of these women are under 30, it's just you know, really uh, an awful situation that really needs to be examined. And it, I think, fits what Tom was saying very clearly because it, you can just look at the hashtag and say, rest in peace, trans lives matter, say your name, and that's it. And, 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 and maybe donate a little money to the funeral expenses and that's it, and not look at what does this trend mean. When the, there was a woman in Detroit who was murdered, her name is Amber Monroe, she was 20 years old, 21 years old. Um, she had had two or three incidents of being shot in the past and she didn't trust the police. So she never reported them. And then and that became a source of contention. And then there was no coverage mainstream because none of her friends would talk. They were telling her story in their own words on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram because they wanted to control the narrative. They didn't want the police to get into her having um, a history as a sex worker. They didn't want her birth name or old name to be used. They didn't want pictures of her when she was arrested. They wanted to control it. They didn't trust mainstream media. And it took days until we actually were able to break the story because me, Bloggers like me, I need a source. And I had a really question, can I take this person on Twitter as a source? And I don't, need, I don't know the person. And so that's, that's a real, I think a, a good example of, of um, people sort of owning the information and having to sort of push my, my personal boundaries and my professional boundaries to say, what am I gonna take as a credible source? Because this is really important to me to cover. And I wanna make sure that I'm sharing what people are saying. But it is possible that it was all, you know, that it, how was I going to verify it? And it, it took, I, had, I waited for a mainstream group to do it myself. And, um, but I think, you know, we, I, I just listened yesterday to this uh, new song from Janelle Monae. Um, What's it called? I, forget, I, I know, I heard it though. <laughs> Hella Talbot, that's it. Yeah. And it's, um, but it's, it's say her name, say his name, say his name, say her name. It's just very, it's a six minute piece and it's, it's really powerful because they're just saying the phrase over and over again and saying all the names of people who, have, um, African American people have been killed by police in the last year or so. And I, regardless of your opinion on that, I, it's, it's a really powerful way that a Twitter hashtag has made its way into this, this music form. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we'll be hearing a lot more of that song. Mm -hmm. It's, and it's really powerful. So if you get a chance to take a listen to it, I encourage you to do that. Um, and it made me start looking up people's names. I guess that feeds into your question again, Tom, is I heard the song and I'm like, oh, I don't recognize that one name. And I looked up their story because I wanted to know. So part of it is your willingness to invest your time, which is a precious resource, to find more information. And that certainly means Googling, but it also means knowing your sources and being willing to, you know, to, it's not going to hit CNN. <laughs> most of the, most stories about LGBT community are not going to be covered by mainstream media, um, or the ones that you should be paying attention to. Read the blogs. That's what I say. That's good. Any other questions? Yeah, related to that, from the um, like content creator side of it, how do you write your tweets or your Facebook posts to get people to? Those further steps. That, I mean, the person has to take them, but you're, you want to like lead them into it. Right? Yeah. So, so a couple of thoughts there, because I think what you're asking is really important, and I think there's a marketing component to it. So I would say the first thing that comes to my mind is I buy Facebook ads. They're actually quite inexpensive. You could purchase a Facebook ad for one day for a dollar. And you can just boost your post, you could boost your website. 
Um, and what I find is that's just a great way to get pe to drive people to, so if you're trying to drive people to your website or to your blog or something, that's a great way to do it. It's pretty, I mean, you could even buy for $5 for five days and you could reach 2,000 people. So I have found that that's a great way to push out information. Um, I think a lot of trial and error. So I think that one of the conversation, one of the articles that I read about how to get YouTube followers was they were saying, just start hashtagging names of famous people. So for example, for Latinos, they were like, hashtag Jennifer Lopez and everything that you do and you will get retweeted. Um, I haven't tried that yet, but I would absolutely believe it because I will tell you that people are looking for Jennifer Lopez's name much more than they're looking for my name. So if I'm attaching myself to her, and now I'm not saying you don't want to put out an article that doesn't have anything to do with Jennifer Lopez, and like, you know what I'm saying? It should probably, maybe it's music and you're, you know, it's Jennifer Lopez. So that's that example. So I think, um, but a lot of it is also trial and error. So for me, what I've noticed is for Latinos, it's really about Latin pride. So how am I like, yeah, we're Latin, you know? So how am I communicating that and what I'm saying? Is it a call to action? So for example, I'm having a fundraiser tonight and it's, the question is, have you bought your ticket yet? Oh my gosh, and here's like a really fun photo of everybody who's getting honored. Um, and that's gotten a lot of retweets. Videos always get a lot of retweets. Like you don't even need to do anything if you just put out a video on Twitter. Everyone's like, oh, video, I love it. And they're just sharing it. Um, but I, I think that it really comes down to you knowing who your audience is, a lot of trial and error, and just time. So again, I go back to my favorite word, which is intentionality. You have to just stick to it and just continue going down the rabbit hole of finding the people who you're trying to touch. Something that I do in addition to that is um, I do a lot of resharing of my own content because uh, I think people have this idea, you know, everything on Facebook goes on everyone's page, which is obviously not true. And um, so I will, and I use a scheduling software, so that makes it a little bit easier for me. So I can make sure that the, the articles that I think are important are posted more than one time. I space them out. Um, and I do that on Twitter quite a bit. And I will actually look at what was very popular and reshare it again because I find that people are interested in that. Uh, the other thing I do is I try very hard on Facebook to actually create real interesting content for people that I know. So I will throw out these like random questions like, you know, what'd you have for breakfast today? Or what's your weekend plans? Or, you know, do you like ketchup or mustard? Or, you know, just sometimes it's ridiculous. But what it does is it gives people a chance to engage and then they're going to start seeing other things that I'm posting more. And, um, and I'm not trying to trick them into that, but I just, you know, I want to give them a chance to, to weigh in. Now what I have noticed pretty extensively is that people do not necessarily engage on Facebook, but when I see them in real life or have some sort of email exchange, they'll say, oh, I love what you're writing. I, you know, I love the stuff you shared. I read it all. And so, you know, I, I, it's kind of like you're throwing it out into the universe and you're hoping that if people trust your brand, personal or your business brand on Facebook, that they are taking what you say seriously enough to read it. And you do that by building those relationships. Uh, and doing, like, I put a lot of cat memes up and I put tons of pictures of my partner. <laughs> and just, cat memes get a lot of retweets. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, so again, it's, you know, it's that true, try to true thing about that if you create good content, they will come. And then they'll read the things that you think are actually important. Um, I would say, you know, another piece is, you know, mix it up a little bit. Because, you know, I wrote about four, the deaths of six trans women this week. That's a lot. That's, I mean, no people can't handle that. And I couldn't handle it. I had I was very, very distraught last night when I read it. I couldn't even write the last one. And I was like, I had to post other stuff just to give myself an emotional break so that I could be strong enough to pick it back up again. And and that's affecting me. I only knew one of the women, but you know, it's I can't imagine how my readers who are trans are feeling, you know, as, as I'm putting all this out there. And I feel compelled to write about it though, so that everybody knows that that happened. Like hopefully all if you didn't know that, that you all know that this horrible thing happened and but it takes a toll. So I have to put some lighter stuff up and or give myself like a little bit of a and I assume my readers too, like a little bit of a break and say, okay, now for a change of pace. And not at all to be disrespectful, but just to be able to function. Um, I think the tips that people put out about self care as for organizers can be really helpful if you're a social media content creator. Because if you're immersing yourself in something that's really, really um, intense, you can get sucked into it. You may not be on the scene of, of your, whether it's a disaster or um, an epidemic of some type or whatever, you, know, you have to make sure 
that you're taking care of yourself so that you can continue to fight the good fight. And if you, if you burn yourself out retweeting a thousand articles about whatever has happened, um, you're not gonna be any good to anyone. So, yeah, an, an occasional cat meme can be a useful tool. Yeah, and I think I'm just, as Sue was talking, things that I was sort of thinking about, so I think it's all about like, what are you communicating? So that will help inform you how to communicate it. Is it a concept? So if it's a simple one-line concept, Twitter would be great for that. But if it's long form, Facebook is better. Um, are you trying to promote something? You know, that's a different, that's gonna have a different theme, whether you do Facebook or you do Twitter, it's gonna have a different energy. Or are you sharing something where you're like, you all need to know about this awful thing because it's important that we don't ignore it. That's also a difference. So it's really about what are you trying to communicate. It can be communicated shortly. Is it something that really needs the time to be long? Um, and what is the ultimate goal that you're trying to reach so that can kind of inform how you do it? Other questions? I think we're ready to wrap up. So, Carrie tweeted, tag me on Facebook. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> there okay. you are. I said it. Oh, okay. That's, <laughs> That's Carrie. Carrie. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, so I'm gonna do a shameless plug for Café Con Leche. You can, I have business cards, so you're more than happy to come up to me. I'm happy to give you guys my information, but you can also check me out on my website, which is Café Con Leche, pgh.com. That's Café, C-O-N-L-E-C-H-E, pgh.com. Um, and I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I'm all over, so thank you. This is lovely. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and listen to what we have to say. That's in touch Coming up at 1 o'clock is a panel presentation by David D'Angelo of Two Political Junkies. I'm giving him a little shout out right now on how to write well. It's, it's just me, though. It's just him. Yeah, so there's no panel. There's no panel. I, I know I should lose some weight, but it's just me. No, no, we don't do body shaming in here. I, I understand. It. So. Yeah. We're David, not, you tell fascinating stories. I know you're going to rock it. <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow, our friend Tom Waters, who's also up there, is going to be talking about take an eight-week break from your blogging, and you will come back refreshed and renewed and ready to kick some ass. Is that, a, that That's the official name, isn't it, Tom? <laughs> that's the unofficial name. It's the unofficial name. <laughs> so we're giving anyone else doing a panel in here? Go to all the panels. PodCamp is a really great resource, so you know, follow everybody, follow the hashtag, and... Get your t-shirt. Thanks for listening to us today. I'm having trouble wrapping this up. Thank 140 you, 140 characters. <laughs> <laughs> Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs>